marching army. It's not like 418. Seventeen yesterday and tomorrow is Thursday. Does that sound right to everybody? If it's not Thursday? No, it's <laughs> yes. Are you going to do the uh, video work tomorrow? I did it yesterday. Um, and I was very disappointed over here. Oh, I will do it tomorrow and Friday. Enough people have talked to me. And anybody need headphones before we get started? We're good. I'm disappointed as all of you are. That's your last I ready test you'll ever take. But it's going to follow you for the rest, not you. You're never going to end. So you're, it'll be 40 years from now. You'll be applying for a job and they'll say, how'd you do on that I ready test? And I did not know this, that the HTTP is going to be online too. Yes. Yeah. Very serious. Yeah. Yeah, the ACTF. I didn't know that till till yesterday. I guess I don't pay attention to that. And yeah, I don't I'm not a fan of online tests. I think it's harder. So I guess you need I'm glad we have I guess this will help you practice. There's no doubt about it. So I will do the speed has changed a little bit. We're marching faster towards us. So, okay. Excuse me. So we're gonna have that uh, tomorrow. Let me drink a water. So I ate. Uh, I was gonna watch if the kids, the students, they gave me the uh, already test, and I ate about five pretzels. That was a mistake. Five. I did eat four. No, now my throat is all you know the salt and it's dry. I should not have done that. I just decided at that moment I was hungry as we're eating chips. I should have ate baked potato chips. All right, so where did we finish yesterday? Ghost dance. So we got right through the ghost dance. Let's go ahead and finish up the ghost dance. We get this. We got Wovoka. Is this right where we place Wovoka? Yeah. Talk about the Bureau of Indian Affairs, Ness Pierce, uh, the Winter Campaign, Battle of Bighorn. Okay. So. And don't forget how miserable it was on the reservations. That's something I can't, <laughs> I can't understate enough as I laugh about it, just how miserable it was. Just a, a place of absolute hopelessness. So a religion like this just swept through the reservations of the West. Even though you know, most like, like Sitting Bull, for example, right here, he knew it was kind of, But he also kind of liked it because it terrified the Indian agents and the forts around because they thought, is this another uprising? As all of a sudden you have all of these various tribal members doing dances, coming together for this, wearing special outfits which look vaguely like uniforms. Is, is this another uprising? I have to be very clear about it. Absolutely not. Any real look at this would have said that this was not an uprising. There's no way by 1889, 1890, there was going to be any effort to try to break out of the reservation system. The tribes were totally in absolute destiny. But Republicans in Congress were really worried they would lose their majority. They barely are holding on to a majority in the House and the Senate. There was a Republican president, but he did not win the popular vote in 1888. And so Republicans decided for the same reason that they created all of these states here, we need something to help Republicans out. They thought these would be solidly Republican states and did not turn out to be that way for a long time. Now they're all very solidly Republican. Montana was the last one. Now it is extremely Republican now. It took about 100 years, 130 years later, but it, it has happened now. Out of staters. That's what's doing in Montana. But that's another story for down the road. 
So they decided to chin up a war, to push like this is going to be a major uprising. They figured a war and the idea that the Republican government is helping these brand new states stop the war will help them. So they kind of chin this up for political reasons. Very cynical, especially by the summer of 1890, the ghost dance religion was done. You know, this brief little bit of euphoria and then a real, it just was falling apart. There were not near as many. In fact, there were a couple of groups of the, of the Lakota, for example, in South Dakota that broke away just for the ghost dance. They had, they had gone back to their homes by the 18, or by the end of the South Dakota. Yeah. So what does do Okay, I thought I meant, did I mention this before? I thought I did this, but the Republicans started calling themselves the Grand Old Party because they kept winning uh, election after election for the president, even though they were not as old as the Democrats, but they claim we are the real true descendants of the Democrats, at least at first. So they started calling themselves the Grand Old Party. Thank you for asking that, because I just thought, and I'm so used to that GOP that the same. And so you see that sometimes the GOP for the Republicans. Even though they're not as old a party, that's a way of just kind of like acting like they were. Yes. No, it sounds like most uh, most people in charge are grumpy old people. Yes, you'll find that out in life. Like me. With that, well, that winter, going into a very cold winter in December, the army decided the best way to stop this, even though it wasn't really going off, was to arrest Sitting Bull, who kind of encouraged it, even though he didn't believe it, because it just terrified the whites. He, he thought, oh, I, I'll just make them uncomfortable, even though it was dying down. In the process of attempting to arrest him on the Standing Rock Reservation, he was murdered. Somebody, somebody pulled out a gun, he panicked, and they gunned him dead. This would trigger mass panic, absolute mass panic on the reservation. And hundreds of people took off. They exited off the Standing Rock Reservation, which is here, and begin to go south. And it was cold that December when they took off. By then, the election was already over, and it didn't really help. But now the action has already started. There's already two cavalry regiments kind of surrounding this. They begin to take off down the, towards the Pine, Pine Ridge Reservation. And at night, it was as cold as 30 to 35 degrees below zero. You can imagine this march of just absolute misery. There were a few men of kind of the fighting age, but most people, most were, were either young or they very elderly. This was a sad, horrible, panicky march on there. They thought they were going to be killed too. It just showed you the level of the hopelessness. Well, the cavalry turned out to be the 7th Cavalry, the same one that was partially destroyed at Little Bigmore, stopped them. And this time, when they stopped them, they surrounded them. They had a rapid-fire cannon called a Hotchiss gun and Gatling guns around them. Just in case kind of thing. Well, in an attempt to disarm them, somebody fired back, and this would be known as the battle, but better, a better way to put it is the massacre. They try to disarm them. A lot of the tribal members said, no, we're actually starving. We need our rifles to hunt. A conflict over this, boom, shots were fired, and the cavalry just bowed them down. Hundreds of people were killed. Only about a third of the total numbers that are survived, so between 200 and 300 were slaughtered. Here are some of the members of the cavalry with um, some of their buffalo hats. And here are the frozen bodies laying there because there's below, well below zero. They couldn't do anything. Eventually, they got picks and axes and cut in and dug trenches to hastily dig them. Um, but that would be, they'd have to wait months. So here's a frozen elder of a Lakota just gunned them down, a mask. And they gave the most medals of honor to any to soldiers in any battle at this battle to try to whitewash the massacre and make it seem like a, it was just a battle. We had no choice. And this one though, everyone knew this massacre. And this would be very uh, good symbolic end to the Indian Wars. Exactly what happened. 
absolute slaughter and destruction. And this is going to become a very important spot. And we'll come back to this in April. Well, but we didn't need. And here, though, is a magazine. This is a magazine. This uh, print would be in magazines in the 1890s showing the awful slaughter. But it wasn't like this at all. It was just starving, freezing people lined up with almost no shelter and then just gunned down. So that's Battle of Wounded Knee. And it kind of fits the uh, fitting in a horrible way and into the Indian Wars. And what about the reservations now? Well, part of what happened with the Nez Perce and that horrible, but that horrible savage, we must now civilize them. This was really a big cry. We're going to bring civilization. A law would be passed actually two years before Wounded Knee, but the big effects would happen after Wounded Knee. Oh, so you jump right to, so it's 1887, but you really start seeing 1890 all the way through the next 30 years. The Dawes Act. It also puts something that's called the Dawes Severity Act. And basically what the thought was, if we're going to civilize these tribal members, we have to get them out of the tribe. They have to give up their tribal membership, and so then therefore they could become independent citizens of this country and someday maybe perhaps be equal citizens and they would talk that way when they are civilized enough so we just got to get rid of the uh, pernicious or evil influence of the tribe that's what makes them uncivilized and impoverished not the fact that they have been run down and starved to death no it is their tribal influence that did this and so what we'll do is we'll turn them into white farmers. Literally, they use that terminology. So I guess the color of skin would change, but also they would be given a homestead. 160 acres, 80 acres for single men, and they would assimilate or become part of American culture. They literally said become white farmers. Now, of course, it doesn't quite work that way, and also implying that successful farmers are that way because of their color of skin. But we got a homestead. Now, just imagine people who maybe farmed a little bit on river bodies, but never farmed, were starving and miserable on reservation, with reservations without hope. They said, hey, here's 160 acres if you claim it on the reservations. Farm! What do you suppose happened? It was a disaster. Less than half of the tribal members did it because it were the terrifying implications of giving everything you know up. So you have to give up your tribal membership to take this farm. Who knows what will happen? And those who did farm most failed. And after 20 to 30 years, depending on the style of homestead, they lost the land. That means somebody else can buy it. Anyone else can buy it. And since most of the land was not scooped up, they decided that it would be open to all. It'd be open. All. So Indian agents, knowing this was in the law, set aside the best bottom land, the most fertile land, and did not give that to tribal members and held on to it, knowing it would be open to everybody, meaning non-reservation members. And then what did they do? A little kickback, money under the table. They made sure that non-reservation members got the best life. And that happened on every reservation. And it became a massive land ramp, land grab. This is a this is the placard in Idaho. The flathead in Montana was insane what happened. How they just took all of that. Right? So it's kind of mind-boggling. In fact, the best, they literally called it the white land rush as non-reservation members took over the best land. In fact, when they opened up Indian territory, what is now the present-day state of Oklahoma, they had basically a land rush where they opened up huge sections and they allowed people to race in and claim land. Land that was supposed to be land for American Indians, for whatever tribe it might be. In fact, the whole, so the whole thing was, you better get there sooner or later or you won't get the land. This Oklahoma would glorify this by calling themselves the Sooner State. That came from the Indian land grab of taking this land. Well, the effects of that be today, right now, today, over half of all land on reservations today are owned by non reservation members. The Flathead, it's almost 70% of the land. So if you go up near Polson or Ronan, go to those towns, 
Yes, they're part of a reservation, but the best line isn't owned by reservation. Remember, a very good friend of mine in high school was a Noga Cheyenne, and I went with him down to his grandmother's house in the Cheyenne Reservation. And we drove down there. Not, I'd been through there, but I didn't know. And we're driving by all these just obviously very prosperous farms and ranches. Some of the areas in the Northern Cheyenne Reservation, really pretty amazing areas, really pretty, oh, good ranch land, especially right about here. And, and I can just tell he and his mom were very, just, it made them upset. And they said, yeah, none of these people are, are shot. All of these were not just production. They own all the best religions. What do you suppose is going to happen then to the tribal members of the reservation? Hmm? Impoverishment? Yeah. There's a reason why the poverty rate on reservations to this day is over 50% in some way. It led to mass poverty. There are reasons why. Things don't happen by accident. There are reasons these happen. And so this Dawes Act, which it was claimed to make things better, and regardless of their actual emotions, they set up enough loopholes in the law to make things actually significantly worse. And it's ironic because, you know, American Indians weren't even allowed American citizenship until 1924. And so this is just an incredible turn of events. And that's why you know, the Flathead Reservation is just this amazing place. But then the most ironic thing is people outside the reservation, non-tribal members could say, look at the poverty on the reservations. Look what happens when you try to let, when you allow them to enter our civilization. They don't even, they're not just wasting the land. And that poverty would be used to, after the fact, it would justify, justify taking the land. See, they're just, they're just going to waste it anyway, so you know what they're doing. No, because the system was great. And yes, I've heard this. In fact, this was a big controversy in the Montana State Legislature as of yesterday. So, you know, the legislature, not supermajority Republicans, one of the leading Republicans, a guy named Rieger, proposed a, a, a resolution that Montana should ask to get rid of reservations because reservations, uh, they've proven that they don't work, and that's why they're... They're impoverished because of their tribal membership on reservations. Propose a, re a resolution. And I don't know who would have And it would just be a resolution to the U.S. government. It's a really big symbolic thing. But it hit the national news. It was in the New York Times. It was on uh, CNN. It hit the, the CBS and NBC nightly news. And it was an embarrassment because it looks very prejudiced and racist. So he withdrew it yesterday afternoon. So my point is, it's happening. It's still this argument happens right now to this day. So as soon as he picks up again, okay. So not only that, what about the children? If the idea was that tribal uh, mem tribal membership has made them basically incapable of uh, caring for themselves. Oh, before you write down anything else, doesn't this remind you a little bit about the arguments after slavery that we came for a law? It's in this very similar, it's no coincidence. These things happen at the same time. So what adults are lost, we have to get American Indians, they would say Indian children and teach them. And so they passed a law called the Burke Act right after the Dawes Act. And it literally was the Americanization of, this, of the children. They call it the of the Indian. Too late for adults, we'll get the children. And so they will force them to assimilate and learn, learn to be an American. So children would be forced to be taken, they'd be taken out of their homes, taken up, away from their families. So,
<laughs> so they'd be taken out of their homes by force and taken to these boarding schools. And so these boarding schools, I didn't write this down, let's put down boarding schools. So they'd be forced to go to these schools. These are children, beginning about 1890s, all the way. There's still be these boarding schools as late as the 1960s. Canada, they did them to the late 80s, or the 1980s. And the slogan of these schools was, okay, it's clear these children are doomed if they stay on the reservation, and so we have to be tough on them. And their slogan was, we'll beat the Indian out of them. And these, were, these schools were infamous for their brutality, for beating kids for saying words, um, using their, their traditional language, for dressing that way, uh, for long hair. And so here's what you have to write it down about Tom Trolino. This was at a school for the Navajos, and then he, uh, for a Navajo boarding school. So we're talking now in, in New Mexico. And, uh, this school was in New Mexico. And this was shown as, here he is as, and they literally had this in the book, savage and now civilized. And so I put his name because I didn't want to forget his name and it slipped out of my head. So, hey, grab your hand up. I just want to make sure I'll see. Um, well, they they were. I mean, this is one of those things where they were, they got them both ways, didn't they? And here's the thing. That the beatings would be the norm. Corporal punishment was not like a crap. Was not just something that might happen if they got in trouble. Corporal, corporal punishment was part of the process. And so this is about 15 years ago. I'm talking about this in AP US history. And it was in this classroom back there. So there's a student of mine, and she uh in class, and she always in class and we're talking. And then all of a sudden she got really quiet when I talked about this. I can't talk really long about this. So we're we got a lot of things. And so I was talking about this, and she got really choked up and started to cry and had to make a step out of the classroom. And I knew she had relatives. Um, her family were uh, pagan, black, white, pagan. And, uh, and she uh, said, my grandmother was my excuse. And I remember being a little girl asking her about this. Her mom, her grandmother had these horrible scars in the back of her body because they would beat them with sticks and a lash. She really sent to the bearer about the beat. For the most minor thing, her big thing, her grandmother wore a beat. Her grandmother. So that's, and it made a little, yeah, it's, it's more than just here, this abstract thing we, we hear about, um, it's some more connected than others. This was a very a close connection. And these schools would still go on and kids would disappear. They would forcibly adopt or force these kids into adoption by saying that they got to get away from the pernicious influence of their families and be adopted into white families. Um, and that would be the norm on reservations in the 1970s. And I'm back. There's a full case about that in some of the world right now. But also, this is a, there's a lot of stuff coming in the courts. There's lots of stuff going on right now. You guys are in exciting times. It was so boring when I was your age. And this is a, and, and kids would disappear. This was a big controversy about three years ago in Canada at their indigenous people's schools. They found hundreds of bodies of children that they had basically buried in graves outside of these schools. It had, there were stories about this. I remember the St. LeBray uh, school in, in the, on the Crow Reservation. And they found some bodies, but this was, was hundreds of them in Canada that they didn't tell anybody. They just, they died for, you could think of the, the reasons why, but died and they just hastily buried him in an unmarked grave. That happened in Canada. Alberta, Saskatchewan. And so, Carlisle School is the most famous, and that was in Oklahoma. They made a big deal about civilizing, for making them more into, uh, to, and they would literally say like whites. Because remember what I told you, they had this hierarchy of races by them, by color of skin. And so, okay, they'll never be fully white, but they're moving up. 
so weird to think about how obsessed by race they were. I mean, people still talk about race all the time now, but it was nothing like it. Right here, former Civil War general was put in charge of these, these camps, partially because they're in an old fort. And this was one of his aides. This was actually the model of the school. And so the reason why they were impoverished on the reservation was not because of what was going on in the reservation. It was something like a disease inside of them. Or was the disease that it was like them being an American Indian. We're not done with this idea. But I should add one person. His name is Jim Thorpe. He would come out of the Carlisle Academy. And Thorpe went there. Uh, he would become maybe the greatest athlete of the 20th century. He was uh, an Olympic gold medalist. He played professional baseball, professional football. Just an unbelievable athlete. Could basically do anything coming out of this reservation. And it was seen as a big example of the success of Carlisle. Well, it's more like despite of Carlisle, he did this. Just must have been just an unreal athlete. Never really focused on anything. He just could do, just one of those people who could do everything, not just well, better than anybody else. If, he, if they would have, if, if you know, basketball would have been more popular, I'm sure he'd have been very good at that too. And the only reason I mentioned this, so this was a book from talking about this, the Friends of the Indians justifying this. And in this book in 1902, it was the first time in dealing with the Burks Act schools with the word racism was used as we know it as a positive thing. 1902 is when that term was first used. I know we've mentioned it before, but that's when it was first really used. So we got to jump right to this. Let's talk then about, we'll come back to reservations, a little bit of the New Deal, a little bit of the 1970s, a lot of stuff going on. But white settlers, these are settlers who came into the, to the, the plains, you know, they're taking the land for whatever reason. So they came in after the miners oh, as the buffalo herds begin to die down, the nomadic tribes, which we got very many are forced on reservation. Ranchers were the first. And so here is actually, um, this is in eastern Montana, and ranchers, cattle and sheep ranching, sheep partially because of the wool, also mutton can last longer without refrigeration. But the taste of people, they like pork and cattle, beef better, but mutton. And the first ranches were open range and they called this like a cattle kingdom in the West. Open range ranching, so no fences, they just let them out in the spring and literally, or let them out in the summer. They would graze wherever they went and they'd be round up in the winter. That's where you get the beginnings of what they would eventually call cowboys. That was seen recently as an insult. And they would later become part of the mythology of the West. About two thirds of the cowboys were former slaves. And part of the cattle, a lot of the cattle would come up with drives from Texas, where actually they were stolen, or the term was rustled from Mexican farmers, brought to Texas. And at first brought up to like Dog City, places in Kansas that are on the railhead of the Missouri Pacific Railroad right here, but eventually all the way up into Eastern Montana. Cattle for the miners, but that would help trigger and begin the cattle ranching, let's say across Montana and the Upper West. There were famous wars between those who want to graze sheep and cattle. Cattle will win, railroads and trains, that's coming down the road. But a couple of things are gonna come out of this, far wider. 1879. The open race would begin the end with the invention of our farm. The cattle could not get through that easily. And barbed wire fence could also be made easier. Barbed wire is more expensive, but can be made easier than a split rail fence. Well, I guess not more expensive than trees. Has anyone ever made or worked on a barbed wire fence? Good times, right? <laughs> yeah, that's a good way to put it. Times that you could never get back. That's hard work, and your hands get gouged, no matter what kind of gloves you have. I've done it, it's awful. Summer job, okay. But it would officially die in 1886, 87, you could say to them, the horrific winter of 86, 87. Snow was high, 15 to 20 feet across the plains. Cattle died, and the open range cattle died by the thousands. And it ended the open range cattle ranching, 
destroyed open range. This is the famous painting waiting for a Chinook. Good one with the wolf circling. Who made this painting? The most famous Montana artist. Yeah, C.M. Russell, Charles M. Russell. And I think, I think, is this one of the historical society here in Great Falls? No, I got them both confused. Historical society here in Helen has great C.M. Russell gallery. And then the C.M. Russell Museum in Great Falls has even more. I think this one's in Great Falls, but they're blending in my head. Well, so you're going to have more regular farmers along with ranchers. The problem with farmers, irrigation is very difficult. And so, once again, this is near Mile City, actually, but taking land from those who have lived there. And going on the plains, the farmers, there's almost nothing to build with. What is this home made out of? Yeah, sod, stacked up sod. You are exactly right. It was sod. So they would cut sod out and stack it up like bricks, which I guess was really fun because all the bugs and everything get in through the sod and land on you while you eat, and snakes and various things. Good times on the homestead. And there, this comes from the Homestead Act of 1862. So open up land that's being taken from the various tribes and they get 160 acres. And if they improve that land and live there, they have to live there five years, improve the land, they own it in 20. Did I put down Emporv? They have to Emporv the land, which is a special way of farming. Okay, that's typing and not, I know I should look or care for that. But I like important. Look at this sod house. See the stacked up sod? And look at the roof being so rickety that to put uh, rocks on it to hold it down. Well, huh? Yeah, I know. And she, she's fairly tall if she's tall, but still. The problem is, this is not near enough land for dry farming without irrigation. Oh, not near enough land. They would double it for 20 years. They double it 20 years later up to 320 acres, and that still wasn't enough land. 160 acres might be enough for a small farm in, let's say, Ohio, where it rains 40 to 50 inches, but not. And part of the problem, too, is speculators kind of rigged the system so they could get the land. But there would be big homesteading booms. The last big homesteading boom in Montana would be right here, right before World War and during World War I. And if you ever drive across eastern Montana, eastern Wyoming, western North Dakota, that kind of area, you can see all these old homesteaders because virtually none of them make. But you can see a remnants. And the remnants is always this. It's a weird kind of, it's a, kind of a sad, tragic little memento of these homesteads that almost all of it can be scooped up by bigger farms. Just a row of trees. They see north side, just a little row of trees. Which is Anybody know why they would plant a row of trees? Yeah, that would work. So, because the wind never stops. Eastern Montana's not that bad. North Dakota, really bad. Helena used to be not as windy. It's more windy now in your lifetime. The climate is changing, and that's an example of that. And here's another farm. Even windmills with pump water, the water tables would be so, so deep in the plains. If you live in the valley and have to drill a well, you know what I'm talking about. It just didn't rain here. But railroads desperately wanted people to move in. Railroads would send recruiters to the East Coast, say, we'll help you get a homestead in North Dakota. It's a garden bell or garden spot. They sent people to Europe. They sent people to Germany, to uh, the brand new country of Germany, to recruit people to come to the plains. Even to Russia, to try to get German immigrants from, from German areas to Russia to go to Germany. Why do you think North Dakota's capital is named after the chancellor of Germany? Bismarck. And there are towns in North Dakota like Strasbourg, German cities. Why? All these German immigrants came. And their idea was rain will come if you move there. Why is there rain in New York City? Because of people. You plow or you have steam engines that smoke and fire. That puts smoke, that puts dust in the air. What does that make? Clouds, and what do clouds do? Rain follows the plow, and that's how the railroads sold it. And all these people came out there 
So here's in Montana, the, the now defunct Milwaukee Railroad saying, you come here and you plow up gold. Rain follows the plow. One of my favorites is the Santa Fe actually had a map. The Santa Fe Railroad showing the, the rain line moving further west as people went. I have bad news for all of you. Rain does not follow the plow. <laughs> and, but it kind of sounds science-y, right? Especially if you want it, you believe it. And all these people would go west and virtually none would make it. Almost all the homesteaders would lose their life. They'd be scooped up by those who survived who could get the bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger, bigger farms. That's why you put Eastern Montana and a prosperous farm there might be two or three sections, which is just huge. And one more thing we have to get very quickly. They're all, everyone who would go to the West would be totally dependent upon railroad. Because the Industrial Revolution is changing everything. But not the first Industrial Revolution. New heading, big letters, right? The second Industrial Revolution. Oh, so, right, second Industrial Revolution. The new one is coming. And we'll do this tomorrow and Friday. I will review on Thursday and Friday at lunch. I will tell you where the list cuts off in the last column. But I will go over things. I will talk about it. Remember the short IDs here for the final three sentences. Summary, example, uh, importance, what it led to. Something specific, specific events, bang, bang, bang. And we must write them all in crayon. That's a decision I just made. So you're going to have to bring a lot of paper and a sharpener. Can I get a piece of color? Can I get a piece of color? Only you. you, have, you get, yeah, do it. Oh, does anyone know what trick means? Let's see if we can guess what trick means. An acronym for the Industrial Revolution. What was the first industry of the first Industrial Revolution beginning? Textiles. Three. What what they make the rails out of? Iron. And what was the main fuel? Coal. Oh, all right. Brick. I will see you. Enjoy your lunch. Okay. I'm going to turn. I'm going to turn. I'm and I'll be back for a few I'll be back. Just a reminder. Okay. Is it the Okay. 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 I had a type of child. I can tell you, and everyone's getting the problem. Yeah, I'm really bad with shots. They do just like that to the shot, like one of their so I'm not looking for the system. Just be a day or something. Get through it. Get in your laptop, right? Tomorrow, from Finish up, Roxanne, and Charles, a couple things I've got, and then we jump into the review. Yeah, I'll tell you what it is. I'm going to 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 tell you what it is. Take wise okay, and your colors. Thank you.